Let me invite you to stand, please, as we turn to God's Word. We uh, conclude our series on Taming the Tongue, a matter of life or death uh, today, and uh, turn to the topic of grumbling or gratitude. And we're going to look to uh, the book of Exodus, uh, various uh, portions of Scripture. Actually, we have a bit of a long reading this morning, so if you feel like you need to sit down at any point, feel free to do that. Uh, This is starting in uh, chapter 15 and verse 22 of the book of Exodus. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Starting in verse 16. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God." In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. And starting in verse 17, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. And behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people shall drink. 
And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is God's word. Please pray with me. Father, we ask uh, by your spirit you would illumine our minds and speak to our hearts that we would examine our lives, Lord, in light of your word and that you would speak through your messenger, your very grace unto us to speak hope and truth such that we would live as your people under your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please be seated. We are wrapping up our series on Taming the Tongue today, and we might have saved perhaps the most challenging piece for last, grumbling or gratitude. We've been talking all over the course of this series about how the words that we use either bring life or they bring death. And if we want to change the words that we speak, then something has to happen in our hearts. This is particularly true when we're talking about gratitude or grumbling because As you probably know, grumbling just seems to be a second language for many of us. It seems to be just a part of our fallen human condition. You might appreciate the story of this man from Atlanta who robbed a Wendy's. And after robbing the Wendy's and discovering how much money he was actually able to take home, was so upset that he actually called Wendy's twice to complain about it. (laughs) It's only slightly better than the man who was living in Syracuse, New York, and walked into a bank and demanded $20,000 from the teller. She gave him some money, he went home, and as he was counting his loot, he realized he was shortchanged. He marched right back down to that bank to tell them exactly what he thought about their service. Unfortunately for him, he was also arrested at the same time. He just couldn't help himself. He just had to complain. He just had to grumble. Isn't it that way for us? Sometimes we just can't help ourselves. We see something, it's just not quite right, and we just have to say, it's not right. There's just something wrong with this. Now, we might think to ourselves, you know, that's really just a problem for the kind of people who would rob a Wendy's or the kind of people who would rob a bank. You know, we're not that bad. Well, travel agents who booked expensive vacations for people would beg to differ. The story is told by one travel agent of a lady that she sent on a really great dream vacation to India, and the woman just had to write while she was there, I'm so disgusted to find that every restaurant in India serves curry. I don't even like spicy food. Or the family who was at one of our well-known national theme parks who just was so upset that the hot sun caused their ice cream to melt. I mean, it's a really hard knock life out there for, for, for us, isn't it? But, you know, as ridiculous as these examples of grumbling and complaining sound, our own examples of grumbling and complaining are actually just as ridiculous though they certainly feel more justified to us. We are a people who are discontent by nature. Charles Spurgeon wrote that discontent, uh, discontent is chronic to our humanity. And I do not believe that the poorest are the most discontented. It is often the very reverse. 
when a man is put in a place where he has nothing to complain of, he feels quite out of place. He must have something to grumble at, something or other to be a grievance, or else he is not happy. Maybe that resonates a little bit with you. Maybe it doesn't resonate with you, but it resonates with the person sitting beside you, about you, that you're the kind of person that unless you have something to grumble and complain at, you're just not happy. Some of us are just that way. Well, you might like to think of yourself as not the kind of person who's a grumbler or a complainer. You have another way of thinking about it. You like to think of yourself as the kind of person who has exceptional powers of perception and discernment, and you like to apply them to people and situations, and then to discuss the invariable shortcomings that you find. You're not grumbling, you're not complaining, you're just telling the truth. You're just an observer, you're just seeing everything that's wrong with something or someone who's around you. You know, we just, we are, a, we are a people who grumble and complain. That's the bottom line. The weather's too hot, it's too cold. It's too wet, it's too dry. It's too humid, it's too windy. It's too whatever it is, it's not quite right. And what the Bible says is that at the heart of our grumbling and complaining is not just a mere innocent observation, but at the heart of our grumbling and complaining is the heart. And the words that we speak of grumbling and complaining are just the overflow of what is in our heart. And here's what our grumbling says about our heart. Complaining exposes an inward dissatisfaction and an inner conviction that I deserve better than what God has provided in this moment. At the heart of our grumbling and complaining is the conviction that I deserve better than whatever God is providing right now, and I'm going to tell him or others about it. And the effect of our grumbling and complaining, of course, is that it not only brings death to ourselves, but it brings death to the people around us. Now, the Israelites in this passage, they have every reason to give thanks to God. They were slaves in Egypt. 400 years they were slaves. They weren't happy, understandably. They call out to God and He delivers them out of their slavery. But as soon as He does, are they grateful? No. They begin to grumble about the fact that they're now in the wilderness and they wish they could kill Moses and go back to Egypt. And they're thirsty out in the wilderness. And so they ask God to provide them with water and God provides them with water and they're not happy because it doesn't taste good. And they're hungry in the wilderness, and so they ask God to provide them with food, and so He actually rains down bread from heaven. And they're not happy because they want meat. And isn't this just what we're like? God provides us one thing, and we're not happy with that one thing. I just want this other thing, and, and He provides the other thing, and if it's not quite that, I want this. James Montgomery Boy says, God blesses us, but there's always something we do not like about it. He blesses us more, but there's something we do not like about that. And on and on it goes. This is the nature of our grumbling and complaining hearts. So let me share with you this principle that essentially guides us through today, and it's this. We don't grumble because there's something wrong with our circumstances. We grumble because there's something wrong with us. We don't grumble because there's something wrong with our circumstances. We grumble because there's something wrong with us. You may not believe me, so I'm going to try to prove that to you as we go through our passage, because I'm not getting a lot of amens out there. I'm just going to assume you don't believe me. I'm going to have to prove it to you, so I'm going to do that. Now, what we're going to look at, first of all, is the heart of a tongue that grumbles, and then we're going to look at the heart of a tongue um, of gratitude, and then finally, the heart of a tongue that is turned from grumbling to gratitude. So, the heart of a tongue of grumbling. Remember, the Israelites, they're out in the wilderness. They've been there. It's a challenging time. It's difficult. But God has brought them there. And He's parted the Red Sea so that they could walk across it. And He's guiding them by a cloud of dust in the day and a fiery pillar at night. He's with them all along the way. And 
Admittedly, the Israelites are in some difficult circumstances, as we'll see as we go on. I mean, they're in a desert, and that's a really hard place to be for a large group of people who's not entirely sure where they're going, when they're going to get there, how they're going to get there. It's a really bad family road trip kind of situation. And so, admittedly, their circumstances are difficult, and we might begin to excuse our grumbling and complaining on the basis of our circumstances. And if only our circumstances were different, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be grumbling, I wouldn't be complaining. But Paul Tripp, who's done a lot of thinking and study about what the Bible says about the human heart, he says this, your circumstances are an occasion for your grumbling, not the cause of it. Your circumstances are an occasion for your grumbling, not the cause of it. So if you think that a change of your circumstances is going to change you from being a grumbler to being a person who is thankful, you're wrong. If you can't learn what it means to express gratitude in the circumstances you're in right now, a change of circumstances will not change your ungrateful heart. Paul said, I've learned whatever situation I'm in to be content. That means there is a way to be content and to be able to give thanks regardless of what our circumstances are actually like. And if you learn what that is and you begin to practice that and to apply that, then you can be a person who speaks the life of gratitude no matter what your circumstances are. And if you can do it genuinely in one circumstance, you'll be able to do it in any circumstance that you encounter. But what's driving this heart of grumbling. If we, if we look at it, what we will see is that underneath this heart of grumbling is ultimately a lack of trust in God. It's a lack of trust that God is able, a lack of trust that God is present, and a lack of trust that God loves us. So, let's look at those three things briefly. First of all, beneath our grumbling is a heart that does not trust in God's ability. Look at what the Israelites say in in chapter 15, verse 22 and 23. It says, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter, therefore it was called Marah. So they've gone three days in the wilderness without drink. That's That's a big deal. We can all acknowledge those are tough circumstances. We can understand some people are starting to panic, and they are. But they don't express their desire and their need to the Lord. Instead, we read what they do in the next verse, verse 24, and the people grumbled against Moses. They turned their dissatisfaction with their circumstances, not to God because they trust His ability to provide, but they turned it against Moses to express their dissatisfaction with him. Now, this is a people, remember, this is a people who, after being in Egypt for 400 years, the most powerful nation on the earth, God pours out 10 natural uh, plagues upon their enemies that do not touch Israel at all, but completely devastate the nation of Egypt. And through that, brings them out of the most powerful country on earth. And when they run into a dead end at the Red Sea, God brings a cloud that comes and protects them from the pursuing armies, and then He parts the water so that they can go through, and then He crashes the water down upon their enemies. This is the God whom they're talking about, and this is the God whom in their moment of dire need, they're not calling out to for help. Instead, they're grumbling about their human leader, Moses. Isn't this often what happens to us? We find ourselves in a dire situation. We're up against the Red Sea, or we don't have water, or whatever the equivalent of that is, financial challenges, relational challenges, situational problems. And, and we're, when we're, at the, we're, at the, we're at the end of our road. We don't have any, we don't see any way out. And rather in that moment than turning to the God of the Exodus and everything else revealed in Scripture, we turn and we grumble about our circumstances and the people around us and all of these kinds of things. At the heart of our grumbling is a lack of trust in God's ability to provide. 
Now, God, in His grace, doesn't just chastise and destroy the people for not trusting Him. Instead, what He does is He tells them to Moses, Moses, go take that log over there and throw it in the water. And when He does, the bitter water that apparently was undrinkable for the people now is sweet. That's all it takes. God can do that. God is able to do that. He's just He's just a log thrown into the water away from providing for you in a way that you never could have asked or imagined. And so instead of grumbling, we should call out to Him and ask for His help. All right. Secondly, at the heart of a, uh, of a grumbling heart is a lack of trust in God's presence, a lack of trust in God's presence. If you turn over to 17, this is the third episode that we were reading this morning. And in chapter 17, God's provided them with clean water. He's provided them with man, as we'll see in a moment. And now they are without water again. Now, they're clearly not trusting in God's ability because they start grumbling against Moses again. And they're clearly not thinking about the fact that God has already done something miraculous with regard to water and that He's certainly capable of doing it again. But actually, their distrust goes even deeper And what we find here is that they're not even sure God is with them at all. So this is what they say at the end of chapter 17, verse 7, they they say, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Here is the question for the people of Israel. Is God even with us? Now, that seems like a fair question to ask until you realize, again, the situation of the Israelites. From the first they set out of Egypt, there has been a cloud. Not just, you know, these smoke clouds we have floating around here right now. A cloud of dust that sits and then moves and then sits and stays and then moves. And at night, it's a fiery-looking pillar providing light and direction. It is the very presence of God in their midst. It's a very visible, tangible sign that God is with them. And now they come to this place, the second place where they don't have water. And instead of saying, but look, the cloud and the fiery pillar has led us here. They say, is God even with us? Is He even here? Instead of saying, God's led us to this place. We can't see how He's going to provide, but He must be desiring to show us something, to teach us something here that we need to learn. Let's call out to Him. Brothers and sisters, you know we, like the Israelites, are being led by God, that He is present with us. We're going to see that in some more detail later on, but as surely as we look at the Israelites and say, how could you not know God is with you at this time? How could you not see He's trying to show you something here? The objective observer might be able to look on our life and say, how could you not see? Yes, your circumstances are difficult. Yes, it's hard to see right now, but, but how could you not know that He's with you right now, that he's, he's guiding you, He's led you, that the Scripture says not even a hair can fall from your head except God allows it to happen for your good, that you can't even take a single step unless God establishes that step for you to lead you to a good place. How can we be so quick to grumble that essentially God's abandoned me, He's not here, I'm all alone? Finally, beneath our grumbling hearts is a lack of trust in God's love. This really is probably where the rubber meets the road. Not only just do we not trust God's ability, not only do we not trust His presence, but really at the end of the day, we're not even sure He's for us at all. Well, in chapter 16, we see how the Israelites express this. In 16 verse 3, The people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. These are people who are pretty confident God does not love them. They're pretty sure He brought them out here to kill them. 
And after he provides for them, and they find themselves in trouble again, they go right back to believing that maybe God's not for them after all. Listen to what they say in chapter 17. But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Now, they're grumbling against Moses, but they're not really grumbling against Moses. They're grumbling against the Lord, as Moses will point out to them later on. Is this why you've done this? Is this, is this why you rescued this nation out of Egypt? Why you poured out those plagues on the Egyptians? Why you parted the sea so we could go across? Why you provided us water and made it sweet? Why you poured down bread from heaven so that you could kill us? It's crazy, right? We want to grab them and shake them and say, what's wrong with you people? Don't you see this God loves you? No, there's no reason to love you, but don't you see that He does love you? And that He's done these things for your good. And again, if only we could step outside ourselves sometimes when we find ourselves in, those, in our situations that we get in and, and we begin to say to ourselves, God just doesn't love me. He just doesn't care about me. If He cared about me, He would show up right now. If He cared about me, He would do this. If He cared about me, He would do that. But He doesn't do that, so He must not love me. He must not be for me. Most of us don't struggle with basic atheism, at least most of us not who are here on Sunday morning. But we can struggle with a kind of practical atheism where we might believe that God exists, but we don't have any confidence that He's good news. Ann Voskamp in her book writes that to lack faith perhaps isn't as much an intellectual disbelief in the existence of God as fear and distrust that there is a good God. More than just simply struggling with atheism, we probably more likely with struggling to believe that God is good, particularly when our circumstances are not good. We begin to question and doubt if God is really for us. At the heart of our grumbling tongues is a, an idea, a feeling, a conviction that we deserve something better than what God is providing right now. And that conviction finds expression when our hearts don't trust that God is able to provide, that God is with us, and that God actually loves us. And we turn that expression of dissatisfaction into complaint. Now, let me say something about complaint. Complaint in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. If you read through the Psalms as we are as a church right now in our Bible reading plan, you will come across many Psalms where the psalmist is calling out to God with what appear to be complaints, and they are complaints. The difference between the complaints we read in the Psalms and the ones you're hearing in the book of Exodus are the psalmist's complaints are complaints rooted in faith and conviction that God is there and that He hears and that He's good, and their circumstances aren't lining up with what they believe to be true. And so when you find yourself in that situation, by all means, open the book of Psalms and pray them to God and, and make your complaint to Him from a place of faith and conviction that you know God is with you, that He's for you, and that He's able. And you're just wondering, Lord, how long? Lord, why? These are the complaints that rise out of the Psalms. The complaints rising out of the book of Exodus are complaints not even to God but to Moses about this God. Their complaints are rising out of disbelief. Well, Moses makes it straight in chapter 16, verse 8. He says, your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. However much we talk and complain and grumble about things to one another, ultimately who we're grumbling and complaining about is God, because He's the one who's put us ultimately in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And we believe we deserve better. Well, we don't want to be people who are always marked by a grumbling tongue because it brings death to us and it brings death to others, and it's not pleasant. As much as we find satisfaction in doing it, it's not ultimately the way you want to live. So what does the heart of a tongue of gratitude ultimately look like, and how does it come about? What does it look like? Well, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he says, 
give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I love this particular verse. It's both challenging, but it also fills me with hope. It's challenging because it says that I am a person who is supposed to give thanks in all circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I should have a heart of gratitude, and that is uh, intimidating. But it's hopeful because of what he says in the second part, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God's will and His intention for you is that you should be able to give thanks in all circumstances, no matter what they are, including your circumstances you're in right now today, even without a change in your circumstances. How does this come about? Who are the kind of people who can give thanks in all circumstances? Well, we might take the flip side of all of the heart of grumbling, and and we might see there where the heart of gratitude comes from. Those who are able to give thanks in all circumstances, we're able to do that when we trust that God is able. We're able to give thanks in all circumstances when we trust that God is able. The Israelites had lots of reasons to believe that God was able to provide for them after He demonstrated His great power in saving them out of Egypt. Well, brothers and sisters, No matter what kind of dire straits you happen to be in today, the Scriptures give you and and, and should give you a deep sense of conviction that God is able to do far more abundantly than you're able to ask or think that He would do. He's able to take a stick and throw it into water and make bitter water sweet to feed, I don't know, a million people or so to give them a drink. He's able to take a few fish and a few loaves and multiply it so that some 5,000 people are able to have a meal. He's able to heal any disease or any sickness that's ever been seen upon the earth. He's able to heal paralysis, blindness, deafness, and more. He's able to give hope to the worst of sinners. He's able to extend forgiveness. He's able to bring reconciliation in the worst of relationships. Brothers and sisters, if you read this book, one firm conviction that we should come away with is that God is able. Whatever it is, He is able. And the heart that believes He is able will call out to Him and will ask Him to bring about a change in circumstances. And God might answer that prayer the way you want, and He might not. But if you believe He's able then if He doesn't change your circumstances, you know that the reason He hasn't changed them isn't because He isn't able, but because He has something better in mind for you. And you will find yourself able to give thanks even without the change because something's changed in your heart. Secondly, the tongue, the heart of a tongue of gratitude is able to give thanks in all circumstances because we trust that God is with us. The Israelites got into a hard spot and they assumed it was because we don't even know if God is here. Has He abandoned us? Is He totally gone? Well, Jesus gave us this amazing promise before He ascended into heaven in Matthew 28, verse 20. And He said to His people, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's a couple ways we can take His words there. You could say on the one hand, that Jesus was lying. That when Jesus said this, He was just trying to make the people feel good before He left. He just wanted them to know, hey, I'm with you guys. See ya. We could think that perhaps Jesus was speaking in hyperbole. He didn't really mean He was going to be with us always. He meant, you know, from time to time, He'd check in. He'd see how we're doing. He'd hope things are going well. He might wave as He's passing by. Or you could actually take him at his word, and when he says, I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age, that you can take that and hold on to it and say, regardless of what I feel in this moment, on this day, in this place, Jesus is with me. He's present here. I I don't care what I see. I don't care what it feels like. I know this because he said it, and he wasn't lying to me. In the heart that believes that whatever circumstance you're in, that Jesus is with you right there, that's a heart that can give thanks in all circumstances because you know His power. You know His ability. And if He's there with you and the situation is continuing, 
He must have something good that you just haven't seen yet, but it's coming. The third aspect of the heart of a tongue of gratitude, the person who can give thanks in all circumstances is the person who can trust that God is for us. It ultimately doesn't matter if Jesus is able to do everything beyond what we ask or imagine. It ultimately doesn't matter if He's with us if He's not for us. But the Scripture unequivocally answers that question. We do not have to wonder if God is for us. Paul makes it clear. It's made throughout the Scriptures, but one of my favorite places in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not along with Him graciously give us all? all things. Now, when Paul says, if God is for us, he's not asking, is God for us? He's making a point. He's saying, God is for us, and because that's true, who can stand against you? And how do you know that God is for you? Well, the clearest evidence, Paul says, is that he gave up his own son for us. If you're wondering if God is for you, you only have to look to the cross, and there you will see that this God is very much infinitely for you. You are dearly bought and highly esteemed. How do you know? Because He didn't withhold His only Son, but He gave Him up for us all so that through faith in Him we can be reconciled to God and know that He is for us. Charles Spurgeon said, when we can't see His hands, we can trust His heart. When you look around and you see circumstances and you're praying and you're asking God, do something here, intervene, make a change, make a difference, fix this, and you don't see His hand moving, Spurgeon is right. When we can't see His hand, we can trust God's heart. We know, despite appearances, that He is for us. And how do we know? Because of what He has done at the cross for all who believe. So how do we go then from being the people who have tongues that are grumbling to being these kind of people who have tongues of gratitude that can give thanks in all circumstances? So that's what we're going to look at third. What is the heart of the tongue that is turned from grumbling to gratitude? How do we practically get these truths of the gospel down from our heads into our hearts where when stuff comes up, it's life-giving stuff. When our words come out, it's not grumbling and complaining. It's actually gratitude. How does this happen? Well, there's a, a Puritan pastor from back in the 1600s, and he had some really great wisdom about how we can cultivate a heart of gratitude. And you might not think this first piece of advice is really all that good, but wait a second. This is what he says. If you wish to be thankful... Get a heart deeply humbled with the sense of your own vileness. He who studies his sins wonders that he has anything. So his first piece of advice is, is what? Study my vileness? Are you kidding? Look at, look at how dark and twisted and corrupted my heart could be. Look at how inclined I am to grumble and complain against the God who's been so gracious and provided me with countless blessings in my life. Wait, look at that piece of myself that's so quick to tear people down and criticize. It's so quick to spread gossip and listen to it. I mean, all the stuff we've been looking at, actually look at that part of myself closely. He says, yeah, because if you do, it's going to bring you low. And that's very important because only after we've been deeply humbled will we begin to appreciate the things in our life which are truly gifts. In fact, when the Holy Spirit has done His work and the law of God has done its work and brought us low, and we look around us, we will be absolutely amazed that God continues to give us one more breath, that He's put people in my life who are actually kind to me, that He's put food on my table. And then when I turn on my faucet, water comes out. We'll be absolutely amazed because we'll recognize that what we truly deserve is only the miseries of this life, 
death itself and the pains of hell forever. And anything above that is God's gracious gift to a people He loves and is for and is with. Watson goes on and says, a proud man will never be thankful. He looks on all his mercies either as his own procuring or deserving. Pride stops the current of gratitude. As soon as we begin to think we deserve the good things that are in our lives, we've just cut off the current of gratitude. But when we look around and see that everything in our life is a blessing that we did not deserve, we will be a people who are not prone to complain and grumble about what we don't have, but who are constantly expressing thanks for what is good. Ann Voskamp writes, when I realize that it is not God who is in my debt, but I who am in His great debt, then doesn't all become gift. God doesn't owe us anything. We owe Him everything. And the fact that He gives us anything is a gift. Imagine with me a bowl of sand, and it's, it's full of sand, and inside of that sand is sprinkled a bunch of iron filings, real tiny little pieces of iron. And I tell you to go through that bowl of sand and get out the iron filings. You could run your fingers through that sand for days and days, and, and you might pull out a, a few of those iron filings. You might find them in there. And in the same way, a person who is proud and a grumbler can go through life, and they might occasionally find reasons to give thanks. They might occasionally see the mercies of God. But with that same bowl of sand, you could drag a magnet back and forth throughout that thing. And what you'll see is iron filings jumping out all over the place, attaching themselves to that magnet. And this is what the humble heart experiences as it goes through life. The mercies of God jumping out of every corner, all over the place, seeing His blessings abounding. This is the kind of people God invites us to be, the kind of people who give thanks because we realize that all is a gift. All right, the second piece of his advice, after you've studied your own vileness and seen just how much you actually don't deserve anything, the second piece is this. Strive for sound evidences of God's love to you. Hearts deeply aware of God's love yield the sweetest praises. He says, strive, make it a work, make an effort about looking around you to find evidences of God's love for you. The psalmist said that the steadfast love of the Lord, that the earth is filled with the steadfast love of the Lord. But not everybody can see that. That's something to be seen with the eyes of faith. Well, you are those people who look around with hearts wide open to see the blessings of God around you. Think of the relationships He's blessed you with. Think of the career that He's given you. Think of the education you've had. Think of the upbringing you had or the home you came from. Or Not all of those things are good for all of us. We certainly recognize that, but consider how much is good that God has given you, all His gift. But if you truly want to see God's blessings and you truly want to see just how much He's for you, again, look to His Word. Because here you'll see, most clearly displayed, the mercies of God for sinners. Most plainly displayed at the cross, where the very Son of God took on your sins and your guilt and your shame and all of the wrong uses of your tongue and mind, and He bore the penalty for that sin, so that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And because of the righteousness of Christ that's now imputed to us, we actually become the recipients of every blessing and every grace and every reward that Jesus deserved become ours. Is God for you? Oh, yeah. Is He able to do far more abundantly than you ask or think, oh, yes? And is He with you right now despite what you might feel or what you might see? Clearly, He is. As we believe these things, we will find grumbling and complaining to steadily dissipate, and we will find an increasing number of reasons, perhaps 10,000 even, to give Him thanks and praise. Would you join me as we close in prayer this morning? We thank You, Lord, for the things You've been showing us throughout this whole series, things that have not been easy to look at in our own hearts 
our tendency to curse people rather than bless them, our tendency to lie and deceive people rather than being truthful, our tendencies to tear people down through criticism and gossip and slander and all the rest. Lord, our tendency to grumble and complain when you've been so gracious. And so, Lord, now we just want to pause and be still before you and ask your Holy Spirit to do his searching work in our hearts. Bring to mind that which we need to confess or that which we need to believe again more deeply today. Speak to us now in the silence, we ask. We thank you, Lord, that you have not left any question about your feelings toward your people, (laughs) but that you've sent your only Son, and along with him, we can trust and believe that you will send us every other good thing that we need that will serve to make us more like him. So, Lord, drive out our grumbling and complaining and replace it with hearts that give thanks in all circumstances, knowing that this is your good will for us in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.